All right, now don't you lie to me. How many of you turned the game off at 434 left to go in the fourth quarter of Monday Night Football between the Titans and the Dolphins? Don't you dare lie to me this morning. How many of you found out what the hell happened when you woke up and saw the highlights on ESPN? Welcome into 104.5 The Zone. We're happy to have you. Lucas Panzik is back there making it go. He was on Titans Talk Back last night with the legend Kevin Dyson. I was in Miami. I just landed about three hours ago. I don't know how much you slept, bud. I have not yet been to bed, but why on earth would you need to after whatever the hell that was in Miami Gardens, Florida last night? Didn't even eat coffee this morning. Not not even a Celsius? No, that's not true. I had like three shots of espresso. <laughs> Either way, we're exhausted, we're delirious, it should make for a good show, and why wouldn't it? Coming off a uh, the most improbable upset of the NFL season, the Titans doing everything within their damn power to try and give that game away in the fourth quarter after having done so well to fight to keep it 13-13. to The irony, the poetic, uh, the poetic justice all over the stadium where it's Miami, after having been there in 2018 for the longest game in the history of the NFL since the merger, having been in the booth, that terrible little booth where Titans Radio had to do an incredible job out of, because I don't know if you've seen that press box, Lucas, or that, that radio booth that they put them in. It's the worst in the league by a mile. Going in there and visiting with them, kind of j- making jokes with Coach Mack about PTSD being back in Miami from Mike Vrabel's first career game as a head coach to his 100th last night. All of it coming full circle. And I don't know if it was a miracle, but it was a little bit miraculous what happened last night between the Titans and the Dolphins. Will Dam Levis out there doing it. The defense standing up in big spots, ending the game. Did Harold Landry very active last night, him in particular. We're going to take your phone calls on it throughout the course of the day. 615-737-1045 is the number. You are also invited to hang out with us in the FNM Bank chat. Did Facebook. that game, sorry, did that game one-up the Colts game as far as weirdness? Oh, that's a good question. There, there are two very different kinds of weird. I've come to expect quite a few. I would say that that's only the second dumbest game that I've done in Miami in my career. I think, I think the, uh, I think the 2018 season opener still, still sits atop the list, but that was a pretty wild sequence of events. Who would have thought with what, like 1130 left to play in the entirety of the game that the Dolphins offense would be the only unit on the field that hadn't scored a touchdown. (laughs) <laughs> who had that on their bingo card last night? First time all season, the Dolphins went into the fourth quarter without having scored an offensive touchdown. The damn uh, Dolphins were two of five in the red zone and only two of five because the Titans gifted it to them in the fourth quarter twice. This was as, I mean, when you talk about the levels of competition that this franchise has historically played up to, or played down to, right? They lose games to teams that they have no business losing to, and they beat the opponents that you think they haven't got a shot in hell. But never never anything like this. This is the biggest upset in the NFL this season. And it's being described, and I'm sure Lucas will push back on this later, as the upset of the century because of how improbable down two scores with three minutes to go in the fourth quarter this particular kind of a comeback was. I did laugh at you when you said that to me this morning. That's a headline from Mike Florio on Pro Football Talk this morning, bud. We can get into it. I prefer to call this game the Monday Night Miracle, as dubbed by Jim Wyatt. Jimmy's calling it a miracle? The Monday Night Miracle. Fitting after the events of the weekend. Yeah, we walked out of the tunnel. It was, uh, you ready to find me? You got your, You're going to need to hit it a couple of times. You ready? All right. Okay. A lot of clout chasing for you, running around on the field. No, no, no. The game. It's not. It's not hard to clout chase in prime time. Everybody's clout chasing in prime time, baby. That's that's how it works. So I walked out of the tunnel with ready. We're gonna go rat a tat tat here. NFL Network's Cam Wolf, ESPN's Dan Orlovsky, ESPN's Marcel Louis Jacques, uh, ESPN's Teron Davenport. No, you don't get fined for t- TD. T- TD's our guy. 
You don't have to get fined for talking to TD. You talk to TD every game day. That's right. I'm doing a thing. Now I'm not finding you for talking to TD, man. There's like, just one more. Okay. What's the last one? TennesseeTitans.com, Jim Wyatt. Oh, well, you don't get... Oh, damn. <laughs> and we're, wa- <laughs> we're walking out of the tunnel, okay? And Jimmy spots a couple of Titans fans at the Titans Tunnel at Hard Rock that have a sign. They're all decked out in their in their Titans gear. One of them, uh, one of the women has a blue Titans Titans two tone wig on, and she's just holding up a sign that says "Win it for Frank." Just win it for Wycheck. Win it for Wycheck is the sign, and Jimmy, of course, spots it because Wyatt never misses anything anywhere going on at any point throughout the course of, I mean, I think his entire life, not just an NFL football game, but. That's what makes Wyatt the best. Uh, so he sees this sign, and I I didn't see the picture of it until you know about two thirty this morning, Lucas, when we're back up in the press box after talking to a victorious road locker room for the first time since November seventeenth, twenty twenty two. After talking to Mike Vrabel with blaring music behind him in celebration for the first time in God knows how long, because that locker room has felt a bit like a funeral home. Basically for a calendar year, for more than a calendar year. Mike Vrabel talked last night about the fight that this particular team showed in finding ways with a .03% chance to win, pulling off the unthinkable. Yeah, I mean, we we did a lot of things that that were going to cost us, obviously. Um, The turnovers, the uh, mistakes, but we did more. We, we did more positive things late. You know, defense kept giving us a chance. You know, we got some stops. Um, you know, and then the offense needed to come through. They came through. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that hard. But, uh, you know, I got, I'm proud of the, the character of this football team. You know, competing and then having it go in a different direction real quick. Uh, and then coming back and getting stops late. And, uh, you know, being able to move the football late in the game, score, and uh, was uh, really proud of these guys. So he went on to give give some quotes about, you know, there's a lot of dudes who played meaningful snaps in that game. Because remember, they did all this without the best player on the, on the team. And I'm not talking about the punter. Jeff Simmons, to have the kind of night that this defense did, and I listen, Tyreek Hill got some when he was out there on the field, and him missing basically two quarters – certainly worked to their advantage. The starting center for the Dolphins going down and to a, uh, there being a botched exchange on the goal line, which ultimately ended up being a pick six, thick six to a Miami Dolphins defensive tackle. Did not have that one again on my bingo card last night. That they did all of this with dudes named TK McClendon and Trey Avery. Marlon Davidson. That they did it with guys who... I mean, there's already a bunch of dudes on the Titans roster who play meaningful snaps that are, the rest of the country does not know. But even even the Titans are pulling out some names. Calvin Throckmorton, starting right guard last night. I had pe- many, many people on social media accuse me of making someone up. A Panthers cast off. Think about that. A Panthers cast off. The Panthers you know how hard it is to get cast off from the Carolina Panthers right now, unless you're Frank Reich. And apparently, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. We We didn't ask him. We got caught up last night. We didn't ask him what happened to Daniel Brunskill um, and, and how that came to be. But either way, they're doing it with a bunch of dudes that even, even like, day-to-day Titans fans probably don't know real well. And Mike goes on to say, but they don't stop fighting, and that's why I love them. He, those, those, that's a quote. That's why I love them. There was a lot made about Mike Vrabel's early exchanges with Will Levis in a tunnel. Remember that being a bit of a thing on the internet? Yeah, that was always stupid. Sure. And it's stupid for a variety of reasons, but Mike Mike doesn't let his guard, I'm not going to say that he let his guard down last night, but you don't hear him kind of express that emotion. He talks about how much he wants their their families to be involved with the organization, how much of a family atmosphere he wants it to f- be like. And there's been a lot of like infighting stuff going on. Not just not just in in what we've talked about with a little bit of the TMZ stuff and the and the front office and and miscommunications and not being on the same page, but 
listen, that locker room has not been the most hospitable of places. There's a lot of frustrated people on a four-win football team. But damned if a lot of that doesn't change at 5-8 and eight when you've just pulled off the biggest upset of the NFL season. And when you've done so convincingly on both sides of the ball in front of, I mean, the vast majority of America, although the other Monday Night Football game, it looked, I haven't seen much of it other than Titans. It was crazy. It was other, crazy. I didn't see it, but Titans legend Randy Bullock won it, I saw. He did. Tommy DeVito, the legend, continues to grow, and week 14 is the wildest week in the NFL in quite some time. Him and his, him and his dad... Uh, or Tommy DeVito's dad and Tommy DeVito's agent making the Italian uh, finger hand motion and, and kissing each other on the cheek very vigorously. <laughs> I just saw a clip of Troy Aikman saying, what's going on around here? <laughs> Aikman not not familiar with the Italian uh, family dynamic, it would seem. His agent. I mean, you just can't make that stuff up. No, it's incredible. But uh, we're not here to talk about that Monday Night Football game. Last night was like multiple different eras of the Vrabel era squeezed into one game. It's the most Mike Vrabel win of all time. It has to be. I don't know what else. It was all over the place, though. All over the place. Like, the first three quarters were the 2022 Titans, but the first before the losing streak. Okay, so just just trying, just scrapping, finding a way to win, muddying it up. Oh yeah, he low gets scoring on. game. Right when the ti- when the Titans had the division almost in hand before the seven game losing streak, that was the early twenty twenty two Titans. That was the first three quarters. The stretch in the fourth quarter, where the Dolphins scored those two quick touchdowns off turnovers, that was the twenty twenty three Titans that we've seen all year. And then the last two touchdown drives was what the twenty nineteen Titans. But I think it might be the twenty twenty four Titans. I think that quarterback's got something. Now, I don't know how he feels today because <laughs> I saw him in the locker room last night after we we wrapped up with him in the press conference, Will Levis, and his shoulder looked all kinds of just battered and bruised from how many times he lowered it, either running into people or trying to make tackles to, to if he made a mistake, make up for it at 100 miles an hour because he is a maniac out there. But it is that kind of chaotic energy that made that kind of upset possible. Uh, we we talked about it yesterday while we were in Miami doing the show. Like we had no good reason to believe that the Titans could do this, other than football is weird, football is bizarre, and it happened all over the National Football League in Week 14. And fortunately for the Titans, they did not make as many mistakes as Miami did, which is not something that you can say about them very often this season. And they put it together in a pretty convincing fashion for that rookie quarterback's first come-from-behind win. 615-737-1045 is the number. Nick uh, on the FNM Bank chat says, DeAndre Hopkins' interview after the game was fire, which is ironic. So you're going to hear that. I'm going to explain why it's ironic here in just a little bit. You'll hear from Hopkins. You'll hear from Levis. You'll hear from Arden Key. We'll take your phone calls. It's been a while since you've had a road victory Monday here on 104.5 The Zone.
Welcome back to the show. Titans do the improbable, but they pull it off. 28 to 27 over the Miami Dolphins on Monday Night Football last night. So you were here watching it at the studio. I, of course, was in the press box watching it, mostly on the screens in the press box because the the, the stadium situation in, in Miami for us, not to complain about, you know, free football and stuff like that, but it's just the visibility is not great. So spent more time, it felt like, collectively, us, the PR staff, the the front office of the Titans, all sitting behind us, stacked up in stadium seating, looking at screens, trying to figure out who was making what plays and whether somebody forced the fumble on the goal line uh, of tour or if that was just a botched exchange, things like that. So it was a bit of a mess all night. But it ended up being uh, a result that I, you know, I couldn't help but sitting there waiting for Mike Vrabel to come to the podium last night, Lucas, thinking about, I bet one of these... <laughs> One of these mouth breathers is going to call me today or tweet me today about screwing up their draft position because the Giants won. The Giants won, which would have helped the Titans draft position had they lost to Miami the way that the entirety of the football world thought they would do. I, I thought for sure, for sure, somebody was going to try and come in here and argue with us this morning. Which, uh, you know, we haven't gotten to the phone calls yet, so we'll, we'll see. No, we, then let's make a proclamation on that. If you do come in with that stance. We're going to fight. Okay, we do we fight or do, or does that constitute immediate Oscars music? Like the second you mm. utter any words about being upset that they won last night because of draft position, it's it's immediate. The clock Oscars. starts as soon as we hear the words yes. draft position. Yes, your time is over or draft. Yes, the word draft. The word draft. I like shall, that game. Shall not be uttered today on this show. <laughs> after this moment, <laughs> henceforth. Just know, these are the rules of engagement. After the weekend that this community had, yes, that is not the type of call that we want to feel today. I mean, it did feel like a little bit of emotional release, right? Because it's not just like, yesterday was a weird day, okay? I mean, Sunday was a weird day. Saturday, I'm sure, for the for the Wycheck family was an awful day. And for so many others across the Middle Tennessee community and into Western Kentucky where the tornado just, I mean, the the amount of life lost in these things, I don't know. It's it's jarring every time, and the destruction is always heartbreaking. But still, so yesterday, to try and, like, get you guys up for a game day, three hours of pregame radio down in Miami for a four-win football team, Lucas and Jackson and I are just kind of looking around at each other over Zoom calls being like, oh. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do here, but let's just, I guess, do show around everybody's grief. And and to have them listen, it doesn't it doesn't repair somebody's house who had it knocked down by the tornado. It doesn't restore you know the life of a of a loved one that was lost in the, in the case of the Wycheck family to have the Titans go out there and win a football game last night. But it just for a brief moment in time kind of takes your mind off some of that pain and gives you that emotional release that I think just. Let you take a step back and breathe for a second, because it just felt like hit after hit was was getting ready to be delivered, culminating with what should have been under any normal circumstance. Thinking that we knew anything about the National Football League last night should have been an ass kicking. The Dolphins should have gone out there and handled a four win football team. Certainly, I, listen, I, I I watched the broadcast copy back before before I came into the office today uh, to see whether the amount of complaining from Titans fans about the broadcast last, last night was justified. I completely understand your perspective this morning because there was not, it was like the football team did not exist based on the level of commentary. And that's fine. Dolphins were the number one team in the AFC until the Titans beat them. How did, how did Arden Key put it? He said, we were scheduled to lose by 20. That's right. Scheduled. Should we hear from Arden Key before we go to the phones? Are we, is this, Sufficiently bleeped? <laughs> yes. So uh, let me let me set the scene before we go to the audio. So, okay, Titans win. We all scramble uh, because it's impossible to get to the post-game press conference room from where we're sitting in a timely fashion. We get there. We interview Mike Vrabel. They bring Will Levis right after he sits down on the set, on the set with SVP. Then we go into the locker room. So it's a good amount of time that has since passed since the game officially ended. And as we walk into the locker room, Dwight Spradlin, one of their uh, great PR people, um, says to me as we're walking by, Arden has requested your presence 
at his locker. I said, oh, I will be there post-haste. And this was Arden Key. I mean, yeah, yeah. When we lose, y'all motherfuckers swarming in here. When we won, shit took y'all a minute. Where y'all been? Talking to Will. What, what can you say? <laughs> <laughs> talking to your quarterback. Oh, oh okay, okay. He's good. He's good. What can you say about the way that the red zone defense played? The defense is a whole in the red zone. Uh, uh, and red zone. Red zone was good. Uh, I think we're pretty good red zone defense as, um, as we talk just throughout the whole year. Um, we made stops on red zone. So we believe if the team get in the red zone, they won't score. Here. It's crazy, I mean, crazy a finish that you can remember you've been a part of in a long time with everything that happened and, and finding a way to win this game. Oh, the craziest finishes? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely up there. Um, yeah, it's definitely up there. Last week was a crazy loss. So this week is a crazy win. I mean, it's been a crazy year this year. <laughs> How much better this one feel? Oh, it's feel great. Um, it, this, this is the best I've felt as far as winning and us, the whole thing, the whole game. Playing, coming in after the win, and the way the, the way the energy, the feeling, everybody was, everybody had, it was, it was amazing. I hope everybody, um, I hope everybody take it in, uh, enjoy it. But I hope everybody remember what we, what it took to get to this point, get this feeling, and we can be able to keep it. I think a lot of people thought, no way, you guys coming here, Monday Night Football, the 13 point underdog against a potential number one seed. Yep. What do you think people thought would happen tonight? Look, Early in the week, we was we were scheduled to lose by twenty, I think twenty five points. Who's um, doing that prediction? I don't know, bookie, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but um, that what happened? I mean, every, didn't nobody think we was gonna win? Everybody thought we were gonna come in and it'd probably been another Miami Broncos type thing, seventy yeah. point put on us or whatever. But we don't care. We don't care about the outside noise. We are gonna come in and work, game plan, and then go out there and play our ass off. That's exactly what he did. <laughs> Y'all mother bleepers want to want to run in here after every time we lose. I was like, buddy, we're talking to your quarterback. <laughs> He's great. Hi, Key Loki this week. I'm in. You're in? All right. We'll see if Arden's available. All right, it's a short week. We'll see. But since he since he requested our presence at his locker last night, I feel it is fair for us to now request his presence for the fifth damn time <laughs> since he's been a Tennessee Titan on the radio show. So hi, Key Loki. Probably. On Thursday. Um, 21 of the 27 points scored by the Miami Dolphins came off of three Titans turnovers. The Titans defense played their asses off. Again, without Jeff Simmons, whatever you think of Christian Fulton, without Christian Fulton, TK McClendon, Trey Avery, Kayvon Wallace, bunch of dudes you never heard of out there making plays on the goal line to keep the Dolphins to 2 of 5 and only 2 of 5 because gifts were given in the fourth quarter that the Titans had to dig themselves out of a hole on. 615-737-1045 is the number. Let's turn it over to you guys. Been a minute since you've had the opportunity to react to a road win. How about Alex in Hendersonville first? Uh, hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I I really enjoyed the win. I think it's easily the best win of the season and easily Will Love's the best game in his short career. But I had a comment about the Miami Dolphins. They're a team that talks so much, and they've accomplished nothing at the past two years. I reach Hill being the worst of the offenders. Thanks for taking my call. That's all I had to say. Thank you for the call, Alex. Listen, I'm, I got I got no smoke for Tyreek Hill. The dude is <laughs> the dude is scary. <laughs> the dude is very scary. When he came back out there. And the, the crowd, Lucas, at Hard Rock, I don't know if you could hear it through the, the Titans radio broadcast. Oh, yeah. I mean, MVP chance, people going crazy. When he came out of the locker room, when he put his helmet on, when he's testing the ankle out, I, I got no smoke for Tyreek Hill. The dude is legitimate. And while I'm, I uh, understand your point, the Dolphins as an organization have n- done no, no meaningful winning in basically, I mean, 20 years. 20 years of Miami Dolphins football that's just kind of been this this middling existence, middling to poor existence, where the, the biggest story around them is Brian Flores' lawsuit and the owner trying to orchestrate a coup to make Tom Brady their quarterback slash part owner. And they've, uh, I'm certain that they will have something for teams that see them in the postseason. And I do not know if the Titans will be a part of the postseason. So one win does not completely derail the Dolphins' season. But... There were a lot of things 
a lot of things. Oh, I just saw the the replay of the the Eric Gare botch uh, botch punt and the the new special teams coach just ripping his helmet or his uh, his headset off and throwing it to the ground. Unbelievable. But anyway. Will Levis, the first rookie in NFL history to throw for over 300 yards on Monday Night Football. That's what Teron said to me last night, and I could not believe that. I, I was also shocked by that. Of all the quarterbacks, and even rookie quarterbacks that have played in prime time, for, hit, for him to be the first, and by the way, he's just out there dealing. And because they can't run the football with Derek outside of the red zone, which is a different issue that will have to be addressed another day, and I'm certain will cost them at some point, but... You know, they got what they needed out of Derrick Henry. And Will Levis, fortunately, for the first time it felt like in his career, other than Atlanta, was able to do the rest. He broke through last night in a real way, despite the offensive line not being terribly helpful. How many false starts? Four, two on Raidens, one on Duncan, one on Throckmorton, who I swear to I swear to you is a real person. And, and then a holding call on, uh, on Raidens as well. It was a tough night for Dylan Raidens. Tough night. But... Will Levis able to overcome the deficiencies uh, of the run game of the offensive line, and they were able to collectively. Actually, I thought they had good pass protection late when they needed to get those two quick scores off the ground, and they were dealing. Um, there were some really nice plays in there, and I think they made up for a lot of the ills that cost them early in the game. But it was cool to see because you've been waiting for the moment where Will Levis goes out there and wins you a football game. And... Last night, as I watch him screaming like a maniac and, and chest bumping Tim Kelly, who's hanging on to him for dear life, as he flexes, it seems every muscle in his body. Uh, you got to see that in a pretty big way. There's a big boy football from the Tennessee Titans last night from a couple of different dudes. How about AG in Nashville? AG. Nope. JB, how about well, from from two letters to another two letters? JB, you're, you're good. I just want to point out two things. A heck of a win last night from Levis, and we gotta give a round of applause to our our guy Lucas. Our man got his first win. He has positive stuff to talk about. He's not a loser anymore. You got this, buddy. How's it feel to not be a loser anymore? <laughs> it feels great, Buck. <laughs> Thanks for asking. <laughs> great to get that first road win. Uh, I do all the road games on Titans Talk Back, if anyone was wondering, and I am 0 for this year until last night. What a what a night to not go 0 for, though. How about that? Uh, you'll hear from Will Levis a little later on, and, and the level of... So, kind of describe for me and for the audience who may not have heard Titans talk back last night because it was late into the evening, and I know you guys you guys went until what, 1? Uh, 12.30, 12.40. So, what was kind of the vibe? Because it's, it's on the... It's two days removed from Frank Wycheck's passing and the emotional charge that comes with that. It's the first time that I think Di Kevin Dyson has been in front of a microphone since the passing of his friend and somebody who he will forever be remembered with and entwined with because of the teams and specifically the play that they were involved together. I can't even imagine how KD um, has been handling all of this, how many people who were close to Frank were handling all of this. So what was that like to be? Because that's, that's kind of a weird spot for you to step into. Well, first, let me say how much I appreciate Kevin Dyson for coming in last night. Obviously, like you said, it's been an extremely, extremely tough couple of days for him and mourning the loss of Frank. So just really appreciated him coming in and, and doing the show and talking about the game. And we talked about Frank some and, you know, and a lot of people that called in wanted to talk about Frank and what that win last night meant to them because of the news over the weekend of losing someone that touched so many lives in this community. So it's just crazy sometimes how sports can come back around and tie all these things together because obviously Kevin Dyson and Frank Wycheck will always be tied together with the Music City Miracle. And I think this game will hold a special place in a lot of Titans fans' hearts, not just because of, you know, maybe the, a defining moment for their rookie quarterback, Will Levis, or just how crazy the game was at the end, but the timing of it after everything that took place over the weekend with the tornadoes and with Frank's passing. So, it was it was a show where we talked about the game, we, we took reactions, we talked about Frank, we talked about the tornado relief, and did it all, you know, crammed into about an hour's time because the game went really long, and when these primetime games happen, we're obviously not going to be on the air until 2, 3 in the morning for hours after the fact. So just appreciate Kevin Dyson for coming in and, and being willing to be a part of Titans Talkback last night despite 
what he was going through. And uh, the Titans definitely gave a lot of people something to cheer about in a moment where they needed it most. Speaking of which, uh, we want to continue to remind you that there are ways for you to uh, help support and uplift people who are dealing with the tornado before we go back to the phones. United Way, Greater Nashville dot O-R-G. They have disaster relief out, out, uh, uh, disaster relief organizations in place to make sure that they can help you help people um, the way that so many in the community, as you see that the injuries and the, and the, the death, uh, the death toll from those things continue to, to climb um, just, just horrible. Um, but we are as a community and, you know, I don't, I don't say that as a native Nashvilleian, but having lived here through one of these things with you guys, um, I saw firsthand how resilient of a community you are, and I'm grateful to be included with that. So hopefully we can again come together and try and try and pick some people up who are, uh, you know, I'm sure heartbroken and devastated before the holidays because of this thing. 615-737-1045, that's the number if you want to jump in. Ethan is in Murfreesboro. Hey, Buck. Hey, uh, just wanted to say uh, pretty good win last night. Um I just want to get a take from you guys on, you know, the efficiency of the offense. It seems like the offense can be efficient when we're down a uh, score or two. Do you think that's a sign to come, or do you think uh, it was just having the Dolphins on their heels there? Like, how, how are we so efficient when we're losing games, but we can't keep that, that same efficiency throughout an entire game? Well, Ethan, in fact, we have a whole segment in the 11 o'clock hour dedicated to just that. So we'll get into that a little later on. But in the meantime, we're going to let you know what in sports made us say, oh, no, this week. That's next.
Oh no! Oh no! This is second down. Give Henry turning the left side, diving. Touchdown, Tycho! Derrick Henry has knotted the count with 149 to go. So was that Titans Radio? Featuring Peter Griffin, a family guy? <laughs> How should I attribute credit? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> However you can frame it in your mind to where that was on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could have let it go, but you know we couldn't do that around here. Derrick Henry, two touchdowns on the night. Do you know what he averaged yards per carry? Not good. Less than two? It was two. It was two yards per carry. His longest gain of the day was six yards. The run game just wasn't there at any point. Last night. Tajay Spears was the most efficient. Well, I mean, I guess I guess Traylon Burks was technically the most efficient rusher. He had one carry for five yards, so he averaged five yards a carry. But Tajay Spears, 7 of 29 for 4.1. Derek, 17 of 34. They just they simply could not get him going outside of the red zone um, behind that offensive line group. And Miami, you know, Miami did the thing that everybody's going to do, right? Stop Derrick Henry, and then you can beat the Titans. Except, you know, this is a different version of the Titans where Will Levis and DeAndre Hopkins and Tajay Spears as a passing unit can beat you. And they did. Chig with critical catches last night. Chig is, as you know, quietly, it's kind of like Fulton, where it started out disastrous and, and has since leveled out. You need more from him still. And, you know, Burks is a different matter entirely. But you are starting to see that belief, that confidence from a young group of players that, hey, if we keep trying this thing, if we keep fighting out here for it, we're good enough to go out there and win a football game, even against a team that you had no no business, none, none whatsoever beating. I You know, I before we go back to the foot, well, we have oh no. Go ahead. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. What in sports made you say, oh, no, we can just stick with the Titans? Mine's Eric Guerra. Now, I know there is a replay going around of a Dolphins player kind of grabbing him his arm a little bit as Guerra misses or, or has the ball bounce off him, which technically puts it in play for Miami to recover, and, of course, that they did. Uh, there was no call there. I saw a couple of people point out the replay on social media. But after they get the stop that allows them to be in position to receive the punt from Miami and they fumble or they muff it and Miami recovers on the seven and scores their first offensive points of the game. Think about think about that. The Miami Dolphins, one of the most prolific offenses that we've offensive seen. Offensive touchdown of the game. Offensive touchdown, yes. Offensive touchdown. Um, think about that. Leads the NFL in total yardage. Second best in the NFL in terms of scoring offense and needed three Titans turnovers to score 21 of their 26 points, and only two of those were offensive touchdowns late. I, I thought they I thought they were dead. I I mean, I thought they were dead going into the game. I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> DeAndre Hopkins uh was was in the locker room with us afterwards. Um and we'll play for you his post game interview with uh, with our buddy Cam Wolf of the NFL network here in just a little bit. Should we get Cam on? Can't, I don't think Cam knew what to do, what the hell to do with that game last night. I'll, I'll see if he's available this week. Uh, Willie on the FNM Bank chat says yes about the Gare oh no submission. He says that's where I grabbed my bat and started giving my TV the evil eye. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I made the joke and I saw why, Jim Wyatt make it earlier. Just generally, not. I don't think Jimmy was making a joke. I think he was genuinely asking, "Hey, how many of you turned the game off?" Like, how many of you turn the game off after Gare fumbles and the Dolphins score? Because I think that's real. Four minutes left in the game, they look dead in the water already. They've they've fought so hard to be there, and then they've just obliterated their own chances. Well, it's still a one-possession game at that point. I think the following fumble touchdown when Dolphins go up 14 with five minutes left, that if anybody was turning the game off, it was probably at that moment. Levis botches the pitch. Uh, it goes rolling by Derrick Henry. The Dolphins recover, and then they score again. All in a, all in a, I mean, it was less than what, three minutes of total offensive football or, or football time that passed 
off the clock. Um, Nick says he turned it off after the Henry Levis pitch. I'm sure a lot of people did. I'm sure a lot of people did. But the but the Gare, the Gare thing, that just felt so, so, so soul crushing. Because they'd blocked a field goal, right? They'd blocked a field goal. Everybody said, oh, new special teams coach. They're out here blocking field goals now. We're going to keep our punter right. We're going to block field goals. Danico Autry is the best player in football. Look at him go. And then all of a sudden, Gare... Gary muffs the punt. You see the new special teams coach throw his headset off, and Mike Vrabel just with one of the all-time Mike Vrabel stares into a human being's soul. Uh, Giardi, uh, Mike Giardi, our buddy of the Boston Sports Journal, texted me last night and said the the amount of times that they kept going to Vrabel on the broadcast was was yeah. noticeable because of his emotive expressions. Speaking of that blocked kick, Mike Keith said on the Titans radio broadcast that that is Danico Autry's twelfth blocked kick of his NFL career. He's such a good football player. That's crazy. I mean, have you seen him? The dude is a giant. Like, I don't think people understand truly how big... D- D- Danico Autry is like Jimmy Graham. Like, Jimmy Graham takes... I was talking to Steve Lehman about this last night. Uh, he said he had covered Jimmy Graham at, at some point while he was at Miami. And just the way that Jimmy Graham, as a human being, takes up an entire space, like a tunnel as he's walking out. He's just a giant individual. It's. I mean, it's a little... Fl- like, Slay is six foot nine. Slay takes up every room that he's in. <laughs> Through no, I mean, through no fault of his own, other than he's a giant. Danico Autry is one of these human beings, and I don't think people because he's not like a he's not like a thick defensive tackle. He looks long and and kind of lanky out there. But when you see him in person, you you truly underestimate the fact that this human being is every bit of six six, and that's not that's not with his arms reached upwards. My oh no of the weekend came at the five second mark left in the third quarter of last night's game. When Tua Tungavailoa, as I read it right off the NFL play-by-play, passed deep right to Tariq Hill, running out of bounds at the Tennessee 49 for 23 yards. This was right after Tariq Hill came back into the game, and I thought, oh no, this is where Tariq Hill makes his case for MVP. When the Dolphins' passing attack looks almost dead in the water for over two quarters in his absence when he leaves questionable to return, and then immediately in quick succession, that 23-yard play, two plays later, he rips off a 25-yard chunk play. It helps the Dolphins get into field goal range and a Jason Sanders field goal uh, that adds to the Dolphins' tally. So that was the moment that I said, oh, no, here we go. This is where Tyreek Hill truly makes that case. He ends up just 61 yards on four catches, five targets, after missing the majority of the game. And ultimately, the Titans were able to kind of... uh, stiffen up defensively with that Dolphins passing game and affect the quarterback in a way that we didn't think they'd be able to with how quickly Tua gets the ball out. And and yeah, that was that was something that was notable to me. But again, remember, their starting center, Connor Williams, went down early and was out for the rest of the game. They were already down to Ron Armstead. So three starting offensive line for that Dolphins unit were were down. Um, and by the way, Titans did well to capitalize. Titans have been dealing with injuries as, as well or as much as anybody um, did seem to bite the Dolphins a little bit last night. Uh, 615 737 1045. If you want to react to the Titans' upset of the season, not the Titans' upset of the season, the NFL upset of the season by point spread margin, Abby is in Hermitage next. Hey, Hello. Abby. I just wanted to say that I think the spirit of Frank Wycheck was all over that game last night, and I think that helped the Titans win. But I also wanted to ask you. Do you think the fact that all the Titans guys played almost beyond the way they played forever uh, is because Matty Rice was let go and told him you either put it out or you're out? Appreciate the call, Abby. Because because what was the last part of that? Let the, she, she's asking. Do you think you saw the Titans play so hard because Monty Rice was cut? And they oh, thought, Monty. Oh, okay. Right. I, I, like, I, oh, I, Monty I, Rice got cut last week, then, like, playing for your job almost. Um, You know, I'm sure I'm sure there's some of that. I don't want to discount that, Abby, but I don't I don't know how – I don't think I, – I don't think anybody was giving a thought to Monty Rice last night, to be completely honest with you. Anyway, more of your phone calls. Second hour coming up next. We'll continue to react. Uh, Mike Vrabel speaks to the media at noon. We'll carry that press conference live here on 104.5 The Zone.
It is 11.01. Good morning. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. Titans pulled out a Monday night football thriller in Miami, scoring 14 points in the final three minutes to win 28-27 over the Dolphins. The Titans led 13-10 going into the fourth, but a turnover on a punt return and a fumble by the offense set up the Dolphins for two quick touchdowns before Will Levis led the offense on back-to-back touchdown drives capped by this Derrick Henry score to take the lead. Give Henry turning the left side, diving. Touchdown, Tycho! Derrick Henry has knotted the count with 149 to go. Levis with the career high, 327 yards on 23 of 38 passing with the touchdown and an interception. He's the first rookie in NFL history to throw for 300 on Monday night football. DeAndre Hopkins led the way receiving 124 yards and a touchdown. Harold Landry with the career high, three sacks on defense, and the Titans improve to 5-8, and eight, picking up their first road win of the season. Mike Vrabel will meet with the media at noon. You can hear it live right here on The Zone. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit at USSTN.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Twenty seconds remains, and Will Levis is going to get to take a knee, and the Titans have come up with the most remarkable 434 that I can ever remember. They gave this game away. It was awful, and yet they didn't quit. They got up off the deck, and Will Levis takes a knee. Mike Vrabel and the resilient Titans beat the team that everyone thought might put up 70 again tonight. They didn't. They put up 27, and it was their defense that did it, and it was not enough. Final score from Hard Rock Stadium, Tennessee 28, Miami 27, as the Titans play on Monday night and they get it done for Frankie again. Yeah. That's the final call for Titans Radio last night. That's the first time I've heard that. That was pretty good. Turns out those guys know what they're doing. They, uh, you know, I, I mentioned visiting with them. You know, obviously we always do pregame. Jimmy uh, Wyatt, myself with Rhett Bryan for that Titans Insider segment 15 minutes before kickoff, but like, I've seen them in some pretty dismal places. Lucas, you traveling with them on the road last year. You've seen them in some pretty paltry uh, circumstances on opposing teams, radio boxes, radio broadcast booths. Miami is by far and the way the worst, and they had one of the best calls of their lives last night. It was awesome. The game was, it, is it awesome? Is it just the most fun kind of dumb football that could possibly be had. I don't know what it was, but it was entertaining. And so we had a caller uh, in the first hour bring up the idea of how they kind of approached the game to start, how it seemed like they were going to play themselves out of it with a level of conservatism and particularly their inability to run the football before they just kind of turned it loose and scored Two touchdowns in very quick succession. Uh, About, I mean, I don't know, like a little more than a minute that it took them to score two touchdowns in the fourth quarter on their 11th and 12th possessions of the game. Um, So the caller brought up the ideas uh, of, or at least looking for our opinion on it, of is that something that we'll see more of or or what, what what did we make of how quickly they kind of turned it on? Because it's, We've seen them chasing before with little success. And the difference to me last night was, ironically enough, late, the pass protection. They held up for him pretty well down the stretch. Now, listen, he he made some unbelievable throws. Like, 
Was it the one to Tajay Spears where it's just all arm in a spot? He doesn't even step into it. It's just all arm into a spot where nobody else was going to be able to make a play on that. And hits Tajay Spears. Found a couple of different tight windows for NWI and DeAndre Hopkins throughout the course of the game. Made some great plays to Chig. Chig did well to, you know, capitalize on that. Levis was dealing, but I thought the offensive line in a big spot held up when they really needed to most. After not, I mean not being able to run the football effectively and not putting him in the best position to succeed early on. Is that fair? It's fair. Levis was hit eight times. He was only sacked once. So he he does get a lot of the credit for getting rid of the football as well. Sure. And circumventing some of those things. But either way, like they did enough to put it together. So where instead of trailing and, or or chasing and throwing, throwing into the end zone to no avail just to have, you know, Quan Alexander come across the the front of the defense and pick you off to end the football game. They were capitalizing and making throws and executing the offense and running tempo. Like Levis seemed comfortable in tempo. We saw more of that playing a little faster, right? That's been the whole damn theme of the off season. And you know, if, if it takes until week 14 to accomplish the idea of playing faster, then so be it. But they did seem like they were playing faster last night the way that they kind of spoke to in, what was that, press conference with Mike Vrabel? January? February? Well, when they were forced to. When they were forced to. Right, because that was not the case for the majority of the game. No. They kept trying to run the football. They they tried to get Derek Derek those carries that you guys tell me if he gets to 20, they they win the football game. And he got 17 last night, but again, two, two yards on average. Two touchdowns in the red zone. Derrick Henry in the red zone, still a a remarkable threat. And I'm not saying that he's not still remarkable. It's just it's it's harder for him to be remarkable right now. So my takeaway from it is at their core and who Mike Vrabel is, Lucas, do you know that they won the football game last night, accomplishing none of the three things that they set out to do in any given football game? Lost turnover margin. Lost the turnover margin. Definitely were outrushed. Outrushed by a pretty decent margin by the Miami Dolphins, who were getting chunk plays on the ground. And I thought the Dolphins went away from the run game far too much. I mean, it felt like uh, there was a big space in the middle of the game where they just completely abandoned the run, and then when they went back to it with Mostert, it was working. And they were on schedule, and they were picking up first downs. Uh, So the three things, outrush the opponent, win the turnover battle, and have a better quarterback rating than the opponent, the Titans. uh, One of our listeners, Det, Detweiler on Twitter, which I just assume is a is a fake, potentially only fan's name. He pointed out to me that they won this football game, accomplishing none of the three like week to week keys to success that Mike Vrabel lays out for them in, in team meetings the way that we know Brett Kern has described for us before. So if somebody told us the Titans are going to go zero for three on those three keys and fumble a punt return that will lead straight to a Dolphins touchdown, what would we have said will happen on this game? what we all thought was going to happen anyway, that they would lose by three touchdowns and that, you know, I would be in the middle of another sad boy locker room in the middle of another sad boy press conference asking the same sad boy questions about a sad boy four-win football team. Like, imagine, there's a crystal ball. Oh, I'm seeing uh, Levis throws a pick six. Oh, I'm seeing another muffed punt leave straight to a touchdown. I'm seeing a game in which the Titans are penalized more than the Dolphins are. Shocking to no one. Seeing losing turnover margin. I'm seeing... Not being able to run the football for anything. I'm seeing death. (laughs) We're seeing a 30-point loss. The biggest margin of defeat on the year, I would have told you, had you given me this box score. It's unreal. Football is so stupid. But it's fun. Micah is in Nashville up next. We're taking your phone calls in reaction to a huge win for the Tennessee Titans. They're first on the road of the season, and they're first in over a calendar year. Micah in Nashville next. Hey, guys. Uh, first off, I want to be a long, 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 long time listener, first time caller. Um, it's a, it's kind of a trip. I'm old enough to remember Bill Romanowski and not trying to equate Will Levis to Bill Romanowski in terms of the, you know, who, who Bill was, but the intensity. You know, I can see that kind of intensity out of Will. He doesn't smile when he does the the things he does, and he he that, that intensity is scary. And I think that in that that could intimidate and does intimidate teams going forward. I think um I think we got a baller. So um and also condolences to the Whitecheck family. Um and I, I 
I'm sorry, sorry that happened the way it did, but uh, you know, Titans got something going forward. That's that's all I got. Thanks for the call. He he is scary. <laughs> Lev, Lev us a little bit. Uh, you're right. He doesn't smile. He screams. It's a war cry out there. That dude, you, Lucas, you described him as going to battle against the Colts last week. What what was that if not going to battle? With his teammates. Do you see the hug that Tajay Spears gave him when he was doing the, the post-game wrap-up interview with Laura Rutledge on Monday Night Football? It's it's that kind of win that galvanizes that young core that you are trying to protect or salvage or turn into something more than, you know, a sixth-round pick here and a third-round part-time running back there and a rookie quarterback that you're still trying to figure out. No, you you have something here. And now they get to learn how to win. They just did in the biggest spot of their careers, certainly on the biggest stage of their careers to date, right? Monday night football for any of these guys, they haven't played in a bowl game bigger than that. Maybe, maybe Tajay Spears in the, in the cotton bowl last year. I, I don't know. I mean, this is, it's still a five win football team. So like, let's not get nuts, but this was a huge stage for them to kind of announce themselves. Again, there are names that the vast majority of the NFL consuming public does not know beyond fantasy football that just announced themselves in dramatic fashion to the world last night. The poor soul that Levis chest bumped on the sideline. It's Tim l- Kelly. Late in that game. No, I, I know what you're talking about with the Kelly, but there was another one where Levis comes off fired up, and it's either an, an injured player that I didn't recognize or a staffer that Levis comes over and just absolutely <laughs> d- demolishes with a chest bump that looks like it should have caved his chest cavity in. I, I think I know what you're talking about because I saw it. Uh do you know who that was? No. Caleb Murphy. Was it? Who's okay. N- who's not small. No. No. <laughs> Caleb, Caleb Murphy is a defensive end. He's six foot four. <laughs> he's six foot four. He's 254 pounds. And your quarterback chest bumped him and sent him flying. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, let's do Big Swab up next in Mount Pleasant. What's up, fellas? Good morning, man. Real All right. quick. All right. I'm, I'm working, man, so I'm going to make it real quick. Hey, I just want to give a a, a shout-out to the, the, the Titans for winning as a whole team. I, to me, it was a whole team win. Of course, Levis is the quarterback, and he led it, but it was a whole team win, and I'm proud of the guys. So tighten up and go Buckeyes. Everybody get off of Vrabel's back. He ain't going nowhere. Okay. Tighten up. Appreciate the call. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the defense. The defense is phenomenal. And we'll we'll certainly uh, get into more of that coming up next. Your phone calls are welcome. 615-737-1045. You'll hear from DeAndre Hopkins. I'm Buck Rising. It's 104.5 The Zone.
30 seconds to go. Tonga Vailoa on the ball. Looking, looking, in trouble, trip. Sand! Yes! Oh, hell yes! Oh, my goodness, Harold Landry! Career night for one honor, Harold Landry. Three sacks. Mike Keith got to use that a couple of times throughout the course of the evening. That's the one that ended it, though, on the fourth and two. I looked around at that press box and said, oh, my, oh my God, did they just win that game? <laughs> it's, it's, it kind of shell-shocked a little bit. Certainly, the Miami fans. The vibes at Hard Rock Stadium last night, Lucas, were unbelievable. Unbelievable. You had all kinds of NFL royalty. Truly royalty in the house for that game to take in what should have been a, a not a crowning moment for the Dolphins, but just kind of like, uh, hey. A show. A, a show. show. They were supposed to put on a show. They were supposed to put on a show. Miami put on a show, right? They did the, the, drone, uh, the drone show in the sky at like, I think, an hour before kickoff. We all saw it. In the hard in the Hard Rock Stadium, or from the through the roof of Hard Rock Stadium, out there in the parking lot, they trotted out all kinds of Dolphins legends from that franchise's greatest years. Because now they're here to witness, after 20 years of mediocrity, an actual Dolphins team that can go out there and put it together. And all that that entire game comes to pass, and we're sitting in the press box elevator, heading down to the bowels of the stadium to go to the Mike Vrabel press conference, and I hear some. I hear some Dolphins beat writer behind me just mutter in the background, the mother bleeping Tennessee Titans. <laughs> just, I couldn't I couldn't do anything but like out loud laugh. I'm like, yeah, they do that to a lot of people, but <laughs> we, were, what it is. we were wondering if we were going to get a Mike Vrabel special like this this season, right? A Mike Vrabel special. Well, are they not good for one of these every season? No matter how good or bad the Titans are. What was last year's? Green Bay? Maybe Green Bay. It was it was so close to being Kansas City, right? Yeah. I mean, that would have been the Mike Vrabel special of all Mike Vrabel specials with Malik Malik Willis on Sunday Night Football. So, like, just to articulate for the audience what we consider a Mike Vrabel special, quote unquote, to be for me, it is Week Two, 2018. That was the first one after Miami, <laughs> where where Delaney's done for the year. Mariota's got nerve damage in his elbow. Lawan's concussed in a body bag from fat number 50 on the Dolphins. And Conklin, I don't think, was, like, up to... They were, they were missing both tackles. Right, because it was Tyler Merritt's and Kevin Palm feel. They still have to do the motion. And Blaine Gabbard at quarterback. And they won a game against the Houston Texans because Kevin Byer threw a touchdown pass to Dane Crookshank. That is a Mike Vrabel special, right, where they're out there doing all kinds of wild stuff on special teams. They're they're scheming up all kinds of bizarre stuff, and I don't want to call them trick plays, but stuff that they have installed just to kind of, hey, kitchen sink time, let's go. Winning when they have no business winning. Correct. Last night felt like a pretty good case study for, for what that Mike Vrabel special type stuff is, a defense that plays out of their mind. We had a caller, Big Swab, right, uh, called in earlier and said, that it was a team win. Collectively, the team went out there and won it. And I would largely agree. Special teams, really, the only gaffe was Gare. And it was it could have been a death sentence, right? Could have killed him. Okay. After after solid uh, solid plays on by the punter, by blocking field goals with Danico Autry, by just kind of holding the line, getting you know getting the extra points off and things like that. Just fundamental stuff that wasn't going to cost them. The Gare thing almost killed them, but on the whole, special teams solid. Defense, Carolina was statistically their best performance of the year. I would argue that last night was their best performance of the year. Last night was by far their best performance. Given the degree of difficulty on the opponent. For those of you who are arguing, uh, oh, I don't care about them beating the Carolina Panthers. Okay, well, they just did it to the Dolphins. And then offensively, a struggle until you took the reins off a little bit and let the quarterback just kind of go full chaos mode. Now, listen, at some point that's going to cost him. And he made plays in that game that again, should have been interceptable passes and we're not because he's just throwing it through bodies. Like he's lasers that he's ripping through uh, defenders, trying to get it to the receiver. And if the receiver makes a play on the ball, then great. So at some point, you know, he's going to have a moment where he gets picked off on what was it? He was backed up on his own five, 
when the defense, defensive tackle dropped into coverage and picked him off there, and he tried to go stop the defensive tackle from getting into the end zone and just got leveled in the process. Don't do that. Yeah, probably avoid that hit. But, um, you know, on the whole, I think that uh, I think that that probably qualifies as one of the better Mike Vrabel specials. I think New England in the AFC Wild Card game against Brady is one where they out Belichick, Belichick at yep. the end to bleed the clock using the rule that's no longer allowed anymore. And I mean, there's been a couple. You could you could name one each year, it seems. But last night, I think, fits the bill. And how about the analytics call? So, the analytics call to down eight, go for two, basically to play the percentages and say, well, it's easier to go for two here than it is to try and chase with field goals there. And so, ultimately, they decided, well, rather than putting putting off a potential field goal, try to win it, let's just go out here and try and win it. The way that they've tried to do before, right? Going back to his first his first year as a head coach, Chargers in London was a moment where they they could have easily played for overtime. They opted to go for two. They didn't get it. Um, they went home with a loss to, to the then San Diego Chargers and Philip Rivers in the London game. So it's not the first time they've done it. But Mike Vrabel playing the math there, and you know, stretch John Stryker in his ear, helping him play the math there. Got it done in a big spot. They were able to execute. NWI, wide open. He almost made a great catch, too, that he was that he bobbled, obviously. He wasn't wasn't going to count, but almost made a great touchdown snag. And then there's Traylon Burks, one catch for one yard. We, we can talk about We can do the, the, the quiet stuff out loud later in the week. We don't have to do that today. Well, but. it's crazy that the Titans almost had 200-yard receivers. And I'm back at the Titans radio studio, and... Philip Noel patched in and asked me while the Titans are on that second late touchdown drive and Tajay Spears is just getting dump off after dump off mm-hmm. and turning it into yards after catch. And Phil asked, Lucas, could you see if you could find out the last time the Titans had two 100-yard receivers? So I started going game by game backwards. And I thought, well, I'll run into one in 2020. I bet I can name, I, I bet I can name the game. Do it. Is it? Atlanta, week four, 2019, Corey Davis and A.J. Brown. No, it's never happened in the Vrabel era. What? I was shocked. What? I thought at least at some point, surely, <laughs> Corey Davis and A.J. Brown no! had 100 yards in the same game. It didn't happen last night. Tajay Spears had 89 receiving yards, but I, I haven't found the answer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep digging. I got all the way back to like 2017. Shut the hell up. I almost said a bad word. Corey Davis was so close to 100 yards in that game. There, there were there were a few games where both were really close, or one had 100 and the other was really close to 100. But so I still need to do some digging to find out the last time the Titans had two 100 yard receivers. They were so close last night, and Traylon Burks wasn't a part of it at all. Oh my God! Neither of them had 100 yards in that game. AJ had 94. Corey Davis had 91. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's wild. Never happened. I mean, I just, it's not a passing offense until, you know, recently. By the way, like, they used to win games with Tannehill attempting 17 passes. Levis is throwing, you know, 37-39. Uh, there there are 40-plus dropbacks a game for Will Levis. And maybe that's because they can't run the football, and this is how they have to play right now. But for those of you who are wanting, like, dramatic change in a pass-first offense, I know they're chasing in this game that requires them to do so, and maybe under a certain circumstance, maybe under normal circumstances, Mike Vrabel would play more, I don't want to say the way that he's comfortable playing, but more the way that I think he's wired to play. Well, we can go back and see how many of those dropbacks came in the fourth quarter. We can do that later on. We can do that later this week. 615-737-1045 is the number you'll hear from DeAndre Hopkins here in just a second. Let's go to Buffalo, who was in Bowling Green when he called us. We'll see where he is right now. Buffalo. Hello. Talk to me, brother. Hey, it's Dustin, by the way. Nope. Oh. And uh, say great win last night, but my boy Levis going down there and making Jalen Ramsey try to kiss his own ass was the best part of the whole game. <laughs> How do you get Buffalo and Dustin mixed up? Way off. Okay. Great job by you. Just a bit outside. Oh, well. 
Uh, yes, uh, Levis keeping a proud tradition of Titans players crunching Jalen Ramsey in big spots. Um, he looks bent backwards. Like, <laughs> I, he, he, <laughs> he looks like he doesn't have a head in the clip. <laughs> like, his no, head he, just he looks like he, he's had like ribs removed. I don't th- <laughs> I, like to bend backwards that way. Like, I, I don't, I haven't seen a human being get outright like folded like a chair that way in quite some time. And also, Levis is bigger than Jalen Ramsey. Taylor Ramsey, not a small human being. That's the crazy part. Like, Levis is doing all this. He's a battering ram. At some point, it's going to catch up with him. And I, like I said, I saw his shoulder in the locker room last night. He needs to be he needs to be more careful. Um, and, I, you know, you can't coach all of, the, all of the mania out of him or manicness out of him. But And, and he's, he's doing well to speak about it afterwards. You'll hear from Will Levis in the noon hour. Uh, after Mike Vrabel speaks, I asked I asked him the first question last night, basically about how his heart rate was, and he, he gave a pretty funny answer. We'll do that in a bit. But uh, it's it's that and the combination of DeAndre Hopkins holding that young quarterback to a high standard. Now, um, when we talked to Hopkins in the locker room afterwards, it was a much different exchange than what Hopkins had with Cam Wolf of the NFL Network. But I'll explain what I mean by that here in just a second. First. Logan in Madison. Hey, Logan. Hey, guys. Just wanted to say, was not expecting that win last night. That was a pretty great surprise. Um, and, I mean, honestly, DeAndre Hopkins, I thought he um, he played – he's been playing well all year. And I just wanted to ask, do you all think – I know he's got a two-year deal. Do you think they keep him next year or restructure his deal? Like, what do you think is going to happen with him next year? I'm curious. I mean, he's going to be here. I don't, I don't know that anything necessarily needs to happen with him. What would, what would I guess need to I don't maybe I don't understand the question. Someone would have to trade for him, right? Yeah, like he's under contract. He's not going anywhere. The, the only scenario where D Hop leaves is somebody sends a package of picks the Titans can't turn down. But think about how valuable he's been for Levis this year. He is so valuable, so valuable to that young quarterback. Uh, Hopkins targeted twelve times last night. He caught seven of them. 124 yards and the late touchdown. He had a long gain of 45, which, um, so the long gain of 45 was uh, lambasted on the broadcast when I watched it back this morning as offense pass interference. Uh, it was, I don't think Titans fans, many of them pointing out offensive pass interference. Cam Wolf of the NFL Network, who interviewed DeAndre Hopkins post game during the game and during that 45 yard completion which by the way was a ridiculous catch even just the concentration even if he did commit OPI like it's still a ridiculous catch but Cam Wolf pointed out before they did this interview that it was OPI and I'll explain why that matters here in a second but here is Cameron Wolf of the NFL Network speaking with the Titan Star wide receiver I saw a dog I saw a dog out here today that, that kid is gonna be great man I'm always in his ear trying to help him uh you know read defenses and and be better. Uh, I know he still got a lot in his tank. I know he can improve, even though, you know, he came out here and beat, beat these guys today. But I'm going to still be on the Monday when we go back and uh, let him know that there are certain things that he can improve on. But, man, we'll show a heart. Uh, man, I, I, love, I love competing and playing with him. That was DeAndre Hopkins on the postgame broadcast last night with Cameron Wolf. Now, he gave a great interview uh, with Cam, and then he was not very – receptive to us last night let me explain so in between the time that cam wolf talked to him and the time that deandre made his way back in the locker room and i guess checked his phone uh he pointed out on twitter or cam he responded to cam's tweet saying deandre hopkins got away with clear offensive pi pulling down Xavier howard to get deep catch howard was in great spot for pass break of Break up before getting yanked down. The play must have turned X up. Oh, turned X, uh, Xavier Howard up. He shut down Hopkins back-to-back plays to force a Titans field goal. Uh, And Hopkins responds to said play. Something told me not to do that interview with your hating ass. Two plays later, clear DPI. So by the time Hopkins, by the time we got to DeAndre, he had sent soured on Cam Wolf and the interview that he had just previewed. Uh, previously done and was not very receptive to answering more questions after the fact. So, okay, that's I, not his fault. We all see stuff on our phones that make us mad. He seems to see stuff on social media often enough that 
I don't want to say it bothers him, but that he feels the need to respond to or react to. And I will point out that that tweet has since been deleted. So, uh, <laughs> that uh, duck falling on YouTube, which is funny, says Hopkins did what we call code switching. <laughs> talking about a two Americas type situation. Uh, talking with Cam and then talking with the rest of us. But I would say that... Um, I would say that his exchange with Cam is not that much different than exchanges that we've all had with him, whether that's Tron Davenport, whether that's myself, whether that's uh, who else travels on a regular basis. Kaharski, who wasn't there uh, last night, I think he was still working on some Wycheck stuff. But that felt like the quintessential DeAndre Hopkins game, right? It was great. I I know he went nuts against Atlanta, but this is on the road in must-have situations late where he's coming up big, 50-50 ball at the end of the first half, and he's the guy that's open late on those two touchdown drives, especially the first one where he's picking up a couple of chunk plays. That felt like the most quintessential DeAndre Hopkins game we've had so far, even though maybe it wasn't his best statistically as a Titan. (laughs) UW says, oh, damn, Wolf ain't him. I fear God, homie. You remember that quote from, from Hopkins on Hard Knocks? Talking to who was the defensive back for the Bengals? He played in the league for a long time. I can't remember his name. Literally, I think, blew out the guy's knee on a play in in a training camp rep where he's barking at him. I fear God, homie. Don't fear anybody else, but I fear God. DeAndre Hopkins a bad man. He's a bad man out there. He's a lot of fun to watch. And and certainly, uh, as they try and put this thing together and build up that young quarterback's competence and confidence, there is, I mean, Hopkins is as important as anybody that Levis has around him right now. I think personally on, influence how to how to handle cer- certain situations a calming presence even when things are very intense that can kind of guide him through this where he's just rage filled and screaming the entire time on the year 57 catches 898 yards and six touchdowns he's on pace for a thousand yard season AJ last thousand yard receiver the Titans had let's go to what the hell is Slay doing by the way what, what's going on back there? He came in here in the middle of the segment. He came back there. What's who? Is he giving tours? What's what is Ron Slay doing? Yeah, Why is he here? N- new partner here at the zone that he's showing around. Oh, so I probably shouldn't have snarled at him when he opened the door. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Nick in Nashville next. Hey, what's going on, guys? What's up? Yo, the way I almost hit my head on the ceiling last night. When they when uh, Landry sacked him at the last minute, boy, I tell you what. But I called to give a shout out to Jeff Fisher for calling this before the game on the 104.5 radio show, and he said that the Dolphins didn't want to play the Titans tonight. It was going to be a problem, and he was he was damn right. That's all I got. Well, I appreciate the call, Nick, and you can give Jeff uh, his flowers for a correct prediction, but look, nobody nobody with any kind of sanity looked at that game and thought the Titans, No, nor should they. Like, t- the one thing Hopkins, and, and listen, DeAndre, DeAndre spent time answering questions with us. I don't want to act like he was pissed off in the locker room and, and like, turned tail on us. He, he sat there and answered questions well beyond the time that he was ready to go and get on the bus and go home. So I want to make sure that I clarify that. Um... But the one thing that he did say as we were as we were walking away is, uh, you know, I, I saw a lot. Uh, no, nobody gave us a chance. I, I, none of y'all in your predictions. I saw some of y'all predictions out there. And, you know, in a transparent moment, I think it was Teron that said, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll fess up. I didn't pick you guys. And, and by the way, nobody should have. <laughs> nobody should have unless you're out there just flinging wild bets around, taking Titans plus 600 on the money line. Nobody in their right mind should have taken that bet last night. Should have picked them to win that game. So they went out there and told us all to eat it. Makes it more fun that way sometimes. 615-737-1045 is the number. You guys were not crazy about the nationally televised broadcast last night. I watched it myself to see if the criticism was founded. We'll talk about it coming up next. Life is busy. We could all use some extra time in our day, which is exactly why Two Rivers Ford offers mobile service. We'll bring the service to your driveway at no additional charge. Oil changes, brakes, batteries, the certified technicians at Two Rivers will perform basic maintenance on your vehicle wherever you are. So you'll have more time for moments like this. Schedule your mobile service appointment by scanning the QR code or calling Two Rivers Ford today.
Welcome back to the show. Titans upset the Miami Dolphins in South Florida last night. I've just returned home this morning. Football team got in late last night. Short week, short turnaround before hosting a division opponent. The Houston Texans, for the first time this season, whether they will be with or without C.J. Stroud remains the question. I did see that D'Amico Ryans gave an update to Houston media that Stroud is, in fact, in concussion protocol, not just being evaluated for concussion during the game. So, um, worth paying attention to as we get to tomorrow, which is already the Titans' first day of on-field practice work. You got a bunch of injuries over there. Houston? Tank Dell? Yeah, for the for the year probably, right? By the way, Justin Herbert officially done for the year. That That news broke earlier, or the news was announced earlier in the show. I think people had been speculating on that for some time. Nico Collins? Got hurt the other day. Their offensive line has been a a week in week out proposition throughout the course of the year. But anyway, we'll have time for that. Um, so I got a tremendous amount of complaints last night about the ESPN Monday Night Football broadcast, and I did not understand it until I went back and watched this morning because, of course, we don't have the sound of the television broadcast on in the press box. Although I will say. After the first quarter, I walked into the press lounge to get a cup of coffee, and they had the, the volume on in the press lounge, and Laura Rutledge was interviewing Mike Vrabel after the first quarter, and she goes, Mike, what can you say about your offense? And he just looks at her and goes, well, not very good. <laughs> the whole press box starts laughing. <laughs> he just spits it out there and on to the next. But um, many of you complaining about noted Homer, no, noted Dolphin Homers, former Lions quarterback Dan Orlovsky, Former, is he an Eagles executive? Former Eagles executive, Lewis Riddick. And legendary broadcaster, I think it's safe to say, Chris Fowler. Noted Dolphins homers is what you were accusing them of being. And I did not understand until I turned on the broadcast this morning to watch it back myself. Um, They definitely went in to that broadcast as a production crew preparing for this to be all Dolphins all the time. I even watched a little bit of the pregame coverage because I had a little bit of the pregame on my DVR. And I I, I think I heard one mention of Will Levis in his, in his uh, seventh career start. And then the rest is about Tua and Tyreek Hill and Mike McDaniels and oh, how quirky and cute and all this kind of stuff. And I, it just, it was so overwhelmingly... By the way, they're playing to the audience that they're trying... The bigger audience there is the audience there to watch the Dolphins. They are doing the, the correct thing. You know, it's like it's like if I got on here and started talking about what happened between the, what was the 3 nothing result over the weekend? Vikings, Raiders? If I came on here and started talking Vikings, Raiders, 3 to nothing in the middle of Middle Tennessee, Nashville Sports Talk Radio, you would probably turn me off. Was it like, I didn't even, I did not, I had the TV copy on, but with Titans Radio Broadcast here mm-hmm. in the studio, was it like they weren't even prepared for even the possibility of the Titans being in the game? I don't want to say that because I know Dan and Lewis and Chris are all, like, I don't... Pros, yeah. I, I don't know e- any of them personally. I have had interactions with Orlovsky, and I talked to him a little bit before the broadcast last night. That's about the extent of that. Um, but I know all three of them to be no. That's not fair, <laughs> damn it. That's Com- not fair. Completely unnecessary. That's not there fair. By that, you. that I talked to Dan Orlovsky before. Not fair. Yeah, nothing to do with the conversation. Uh, you don't have to. Lo- I just meant to say that I don't know them, but I know they're prepared. You don't have to like those guys, but they are all very good at their jobs. Now I'm gonna have to get Dan on the radio show this week, and then you can then you can find me together for name dropping unnecessarily. Um, I did think that like. Even the way that they reacted to some of the penalties that they thought should have been called on the Titans that weren't called on the Titans, like the way that they were arguing vigorously for a horse collar on the play that injured Tyreek Hill, Sean Murphy bunting, the way that he was tackled, like it it all I could understand why as a Titan fan that if I was watching that through the prism of a Titans fan, I would be not thrilled with the level of commentary and discourse, not about my team, but about how my team is wronging the other team and the potential MVP candidate. I thought it was a horse collar. I thought I thought you could have made the argument yeah. for a horse collar. But I think I think the tone, the tone, I, I can't describe it, Lucas, other than for you to go watch it yourself if you have some time. And that's that's pretty early on. So you can kind of get the gist 
of how the rest of the evening went. Um, but I will say that, listen, what you guys need to know about these things, it's, the, it's, it's not the same as how we prepare for the radio show, but we go in every day with a theme, right? We go in, it's, it's like, it's usually the title of the live stream, right? The, whatever the theme for the day is going to be. The Monday Night Football crew for Titans-Dolphins went in to Monday Night Football, Titans-Dolphins, with a theme. And that was the Dolphins are here, the Dolphins are the best team in the AFC, the Dolphins have potentially a record-setting offense, and the Dolphins may lay another 70-burger on somebody tonight. Well, wh why do, what do we talk about every day? Titans. Why do we do that? Because that's what people care about. Right. The majority of our audience, the vast majority, just wants to talk Titans. That's right. The majority of the television audience last night was tuning in to watch the Dolphins in the most exciting offense in football. Sure. But the fan base that was on the other side of that, who was there to watch their game as well, you know, was butthurt about yeah, it. Yeah, and that's fair. And I understood. I understood. I I get what, what they did as a broadcast crew, I thought was the correct decision. Play up the Dolphins angle all you want. Play it up. Even in your production meetings with the Titan staff, play up the Dolphins angle, right? Mike McDaniel, how hard is he to defend as a as a defensive minded head coach? Mike, make it about McDaniel. Make it about the quirkiness, all the all the fun outfits and the jeweling on the sideline and all the different stuff, right? All of it. Um, because that's what the vast majority of people if I I told you, if I was a neutral observer and not there specifically to cover and watch the Tennessee Titans play a football game, I would prefer to watch the Dolphins as a neutral football fan observer. That there's no disputing that. No disputing that. I didn't watch the Giants-Packers game, but I bet you the story was Tommy DeVito. It's everywhere. Despite the Giants being 4-8 and eight going into that game. It's everywhere because the Giants have a – I mean, the Giants and Packers, big fan base size, whatever. Like, I'm not going to get into a bleep measuring contest. But I, I got what the, why the broadcast did it the way they did it. I understood why Titans fans were upset by it. 615-737-1045 is the number. Derek in Murfreesboro is next. Hey, bud. Hey. A couple of points. I'll try to make it quick. First, last night's commentary was bland. Um, it seemed one-sided. Secondly, if the Dolphins' offense was the greatest show on ice, as we were being told, that not say more about the Titans' secondary performance last night? And lastly, I'm hearing all these people call in and talk about how great this win was. We didn't need a win. We need draft picks. No, nope. sorry, Derek. It was going well, Derek, until it wasn't. We almost made it through. I mean, well, we made it through two hours of the show, almost two hours of the show before somebody said the word draft. Listen, the rules of engagement today, if you bring up your draft pick, if you bring up the word draft, you get the music early. I don't care about your draft pick. You can care about your draft pick. I don't care about your draft pick. I care about the fact that you pulled off the biggest upset of the NFL season. They may still miss the playoffs, and I still don't care about your draft pick. Mike Vrabel also probably doesn't care about your 2024 draft picks. He's coming up next.
It is 12 o'clock. Good afternoon. I'm Lucas Panzeca from the 104.5 The Zone Studios. The Titans pulled out a Monday night football thriller in Miami, scoring 15 points within the final three minutes to win 28 28- 27 over the Miami Dolphins. Titans led 13 to 10 going into the fourth, but a turnover on a punt return and a fumble by the offense set up the Dolphins for two quick touchdowns before Will Levis led the team on back-to-back touchdown drives capped by a Derrick Henry score to take the lead. Levis, a career-high 327 yards, 23 of 38 passing with a touchdown and an interception. Harold Landry with a career-high three sacks on defense, including a sack on fourth down late that sealed it for the Titans, who improved to 5-8 and eight and pick up their first road win of the season. Mike Vrabel meeting with the media as we speak. You can hear it live right here on The Zone in just a few moments. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit USSTN.com. Breaking news at 1. Send your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 104.5 The Zone. Final hour. Time for me to shut up, though. Mike Vrabel's at the podium after just upsetting the Dolphins the last night. Um, on the pick six, you know, we got guys that are, you know, battling to try to block an extra point, whether it's Nico or Weave or Arden, you know, I think set the tone. And then ultimately blocking uh, the next field goal, you know, Danico or Kayvon and sprinting 40 yards at tackle the running back on the two-yard line in the red zone, which then forced them to, to run another snap, which they fumbled, and we recovered. You know, Danico at the end of the game, you know, coming out of the stack uh, and tackling, you know, Oshane there on the side, which kept him in bounds and kept the clock running. Um, you know, those things probably go unnoticed, and there's a lot of other ones as well. Um, but those are the ones that, that stick out in my mind. So, you know, you, you have to play this game. Um, you know, with a demeanor, with an attitude, with a willingness to uh, to play as hard as you possibly can, and and not, you know, and not think about well, can I make the play or can I get there? You're you're going with the intent to get there. Going into that game, what was it something that you wanted to do as far as getting Tajay involved in the passing game? Or was that just something that just kind of well, evolved? I think you know we we try you know to get Tajay the ball. Try to get Derek the ball, try to get Hop the ball, try to get Traylon and Chig. I mean, there's it's just kind of sometimes the way that the the game goes and you know, we try to get him there, the the ball backed up and that didn't go very well. Um liked some of the, the matchups. You know, I thought that the um you know the 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 catch on third down, you know, was huge. Um, didn't convert, but you know, and they, you know, Tajay caught it, fumbled, got out of bounds. But you know, the screen there um, at, at the end, you know, what was a was a big play to be able to go back to that and hit a screen uh, to Tajay. Um, so again, he's helped us, you know, trying to get some conversions, and you, you saw that uh, Will got it out of his hand and got it to Tajay, and he, you know, cut up and got a first down, and that's, you know, sometimes you have to do that and let players. Uh, make a play as opposed to throwing it past the sticks and just saying let's get the ball out of our hands and get it to a playmaker and see if they can tackle them. You know, the, the all rookie running backs and yards from scrimmage is this usage is that kind of what you envision when you guys selected him? Yeah, I mean I think so. You know, then having him be able to go in there in training camp and protect I think was the first thing to have to you know be comfortable with that. Um, there you go. That's okay. Feliz Navidad. Spirit. No, you didn't. Um, but I think, you know, you start there so that you don't always have to, you know, you can't free release him every time he's in there. That doesn't work right there. You have to stand in there and protect. And he showed that. Um, I think he's worked hard at, at understanding uh, route craft and and getting open and being able to, you know, he's done a nice job catching the football. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, that the role that he's in now is um, kind of what we had envisioned, and that sometimes expands based on, you know, the game and, and where we're at. How good was it to see the way Harold played last night, especially in the fourth quarter, three sacks? Yeah, I, I thought that those guys competed. They, they battled. Um, did some good things down in the red zone when we needed to, and we played a little bit of base. And um, his ability to transition uh, from an end to an outside linebacker, and his versatility, and you know, had ran into really nice, you know, stunt there where he went inside, picked, and, and drove, and, and got the got the sack, and was was very active. And you know, that was you know, we need our our, our best players to play good in order for us to win. Tackling, especially in the secondary last night. Well, I, I think it could have been better. I, I think that they've got some guys that are pretty, pretty fast, and and I think we we rallied and and guys uh, ran to the football, so the misses weren't probably as as glaring. Um, you know, we fit up a couple of those runs uh, just like we wanted to. Um, you know, they just kind of got that got the corner to us, and you know that probably led to a few double digit drives, but. I think all in all that uh, that they tackled, we 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 contained them. You know, longest gain I think was probably 25 yards. They had a handful of 15 yarders, but you know didn't have the didn't have the top off ones. As far as the team overall, like, I mean, playoff status probably doesn't change too much. But what, what's most gained? Do you think in terms of the long run for the team? What do you what do you pick up most from a game like that? Well, I think just. That it can go in different directions, you know. It's, you know, it's a it it starts out one way, and you know, things aren't going great for you. You stick around, you make it close, you you finish the half off real positive with a with a stop, and you know, a, a field goal there to end uh, the half, and you know, playing the type of game that you want, and then mistakes happen, and you don't, you know, you don't shut it down. You find ways to get stops, and you know the defense, you know, allowed us to to do that. You know, to to be able to get those guys stopped in three plays and have our timeouts, and you know, then get another stop again at the end when you know they need the field goal. So um, I would say very complimentary in, in all three phases. But then you know we are all you know everybody was able to overcome you know whatever mistakes that the other units made. And uh, that's what that's what a team's about, and I appreciate that about him. Sean Murphy, Bunny, one of those guys. He, he seemed like he dealt with some adversity and responded well to it at times too. How'd you assess maybe his? Yeah, that's it. You know, I mean, I think that's the the mentality that you have to have, especially playing corner. Um, you know, they throw it on you, they catch it, you come back and you know challenge and line up again and play, and you know that was that was what he did. And so, you know, you have to. You know that that's the only thing that you can focus on is is moving forward and you know how, how you're going to respond and by playing a corner in this league they're you know they're going to throw the ball and uh, if you get it caught on you just have to come back and and keep working and keep challenging and and have that uh, resolve to to finally make a play. Will's running obviously adds a nice dimension, but I believe last week after the helicopter you talked about. Him being careful, and then he was throwing his shoulder around a couple different occasions yesterday. How do you how do you kind of use that element to <clears throat> temper the injury risk? Um, I don't know. I think uh, we're still trying to work on that. We showed him examples of quarterbacks sliding and using the rules to their advantage. I guess we'll have to show him examples of quarterbacks not sliding and getting the shit knocked out of them. So. We're going to try the the other way this week. So, I mean, did you point to all the quarterbacks who are out? I mean, like half the league is down at this point. I mean, it just you know, he 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 knows it, and 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 we all know it. Um, you know, we'll we'll have to keep working on it, keep reminding them. Um, but when you guys. Shoot yourself in the foot twice there at the end of the game. Suddenly the odds are really stacked against you. What was the message on the sideline, and maybe what does it say about the resolve of your team that they they stayed in it and then ultimately won the game? Yeah, I just you know, I think to the leadership that we have out there, to the guys that you know just go and play the next snap and say, hey, you know we're gonna need two scores, so 
we better get this first one quick and and they did we hit a couple plays and uh yeah i felt like they were just excited about being in that football game and and the whole plan was obviously to you know, to put them in a game and find a way to win it late and uh we did that for the most part and then you know had to kind of go off script there a little bit and uh which was great to see us be able to to move the ball quickly uh, in a no huddle situation and then get the two point conversion and then get the stop on defense and you know go back down and score so th those are all the situations that we cover those are things that we talk about you know we're able to keep our timeouts which you know really gives you an advantage when you can get them stopped there and use your timeouts and use the clock over the last couple of years, a lot of times, how this team is not really suited for the big drop back game. But then when you had to have it in the fourth quarter last night, it was there and you were able to, you know, use it and be successful. How much of it is that a sign of growth? For the yeah, game? well, I think that we've always done, you know, we've been capable in, in those two minute situations. And, you know, when I, when I talk about drop back, I mean, you can look and study, um, even the Miami Dolphins, when you look at their first and second down passing, it's it's not a drop back passing game, right? It's it's play action. There's there's play passes, and they they do a nice job. It's not like five guys are out in the route, and that's you know I guess sometimes that when you when you go to that mode, it makes it difficult. So I think that we were able to marry, um, you know, even on the on the big one to hop, we were able to to kind of chip our way out and get some layers and get some levels. So I think that's the balance of, you know, being able to, to move the football down the field, but also, you know, be able to protect um, and, and help protect the quarterback and, and the offensive line when, you know, those, those you know, there's good front there, they're active front, very, you know, good rushers. And so, you know, there's a good balance there. How'd you like your new punter did? Yeah, I thought Ty was great. Um, you know, did a nice job with his hang time, with his location, uh, operated uh, with, with the with the snap, and you know, seemed confident and you know really liked being around him, and you know he was excited to be a part of the victory. Was completely healthy last night, or uh, just coach's decision? You know, he's been yeah. I meant you know, Bernie's been you know, but Bernie battles and uh, competes and. You know, just late in the season and trying to, you know, trying to get some, you know, a bigger body in there and just try to rotate through with, with Calvin and, you know, help him out there. And Bernie was back in there late, had a huge block on the, on the screen and did, did some nice things. So, you know, just kind of where we're at, trying to wanted to take a look at, at Calvin and it communicated that with, with Bernie there, uh, you know, during the week. How'd Calvin do? Oh, he was good. I mean, he had some good plays and, you know, again, that's some plays we'd like to have back with, with everybody, especially, you know, just working some combinations in a run game and need, needing to be better there. Pre-snap penalties continue to be an issue with some repeat offenders at this point. What's the disconnect there? Like, what has to happen to clean that up? I, I don't know. I'm not – I don't jump offside. So, when you have an opportunity to ask the players, you could ask them where the disconnect is with the music, the crowd noise, the cadence that we use at practice. But I don't, you know – I, I don't. I, I jumped off sides plenty when I was playing, so I don't know. I'm, I'm with you. You know, I mean, it's like it's frustrating to see whether they're locked in and <clears throat> you know, and there's Simon or a pass rush, and we went through the week where it was the third down escapade, and you know, we just not to you know, it, it's just. I guess just frustrating that those are mistakes that, you know, we, we can't make and you know, overcome second and 15 or first and 15. Even though uh, he shouldn't have been in the area, uh, did, when you watch the film, was there any uh, interference with Gare as he was trying to field the punt there? Did you see? Somebody yeah, there? you know, um, it just need to get some clarification on, on, on the, you know, I mean, being able to grab the guy's arm or play through the returner you know, once the ball hits. So, again, in traffic, uh, that's still not a decision, you know, that we want to make. There, There's times where, you know, you get a favorable hop in, in the middle of the field and, you know, there, there's no, you know, we're not in traffic. And, again, we've seen those where, you know, you square it up and, you know, you get a good bounce and you can take it. 
you know, coming over there from the side and, and not being uh, – that just not a favorable look for us to want to field that uh, punt off the bounce there. And those are times where you could see the players, the returners, take the, the bounce and, and get some yards. Um, that would be a situation where we would not want to do that. How to get over that hump? I mean, I would assume as the, the losses pile up, it becomes – a mental hurdle. I I, you know, we weren't really talking about that. It was more about what we needed to do. You know, I mean, it wasn't well. We haven't won on a road. It was like, you know, there's a lot of reasons why you, why you don't win and it's all the mistakes. And, you know, those are still there, unfortunately. We made it harder on ourselves than what it had to be. Um, but we, we made more plays in the end when we had to in the critical situations. We were 16 points on the road in, in like a calendar year. I mean, that, that, that despite the mistakes, that's still big growth for your team. Sure. Yeah, I mean, being able to go down there and score in the red zone and our ability to force the number one offense in the red zone to kick field goals was the factor in the game, even all the mistakes that we had. When you get down to, you know, looking at why we won, we, we forced the best red zone team in the league to kick field goals. State is kind of the hype man in warm ups. Is that something he wanted to do for Yeah, that was something that he wanted to do and I'm you know trying to recognize his his role and his leadership and being you know willing to be in it on the sidelines and be engaged in support uh, in any way that he can while he's while he's out. It's always the element of keeping the faith when a team does something that's not been done in forever with those Winning in the three minutes down 14 in regulation, is is there a a jarring feeling like, whoa, we can do? I think you probably need. Yeah, I mean, you talk about confidence. Like, you know, we go through this all the time when we ask, well, are they confident? Well, if you can go out and you do it, that's how you build confidence. And whether that's in practice or, most importantly, the games. You, know, you have to be able to see those things and have small victories. And you know, so for our football team, I think that that's a that's a it's a huge opportunity to see us um, compete to to find ways to win the game, and and as opposed to finding ways to lose it, um, trying to eliminate some of the bad football still that the things that are going to get you beat. But they they stuck around, and we we were the ones that that made the plays in a critical situation. And it's uh, Chig Conquo, you know, talking to him, a lot of the work he's putting in after practice, you know, he feels like that's giving him confidence. From your perspective, especially after seeing what he did last night, how do you uh, respond to that? Or how do you, do you think that's, that's the case? Yeah, I mean, again, he's, he's the one that puts the work in. And, you know, Tony works extremely hard with that group. And, you know, we ask Chig sometimes to, to chip, but we also try to find him the football um, down the field, I thought the the screen was was well designed. I thought it was well blocked. I thought he did a nice job, you know, versus the press to be able to push him off, come back. I thought Dylan did a nice job, and we got to keep finding ways to to get uh, Chig the football. You know, had a contested catch there that you know, caught in traffic and got hit. Picked up another uh, first down, and you know, late in the game, so. You know, and the more that he can help us, um, you know, the better. Aside from the plays DeAndre makes on the field, what, how, how big of an impact has he made maybe on Will, maybe in players around him in that role? Well, I think that that would be best, you know, discussed with Will. But I know that, you know, having a guy that you feel like you can go to uh, when you have to have it um, probably is a good feeling. And, and Hop's done that. He's come up big. Uh, he's got a good feel of you know, where to be on certain routes and his timing and his uh, his ability to make plays on the sideline. Uh, you know, very sure-handed and you know, so he's I think he's helped us in, in a lot of regards. But I think that Will may be able to to express that better than I can in in what he means to to the to the quarterback. <laughs> You're listening to Titans head coach Mike Vrabel at the podium after they upset the Dolphins last night. Change a lot of, of the things you and the keys that you have to focus in on uh, going against you know guys like Waddle and mm -hmm. Hill. Yeah, I mean we don't want to sit there and you know be pressed and you know know that the ball is going to go over your head or going to go you know that's where it's going. Um, 
try to defend from the top of the numbers to the top of the numbers. Did that sometimes, didn't sometimes. They you know, transitioned and, and, and threw a few balls outside, which that's what they were going to, you know, said that they do that, then, you know, give them credit and uh, we'll go from there. But we know what it was going to look like if and they were able to, to, to hit the first read uh, inside and, uh, you know, make them drive it. You know, make them drive it and, and then find ways to, to get the drive stop was ultimately what we kept preaching to everybody on defense the entire week, whether that was on third down, which which we did, fourth down there at the end, and then the few times uh, in the red zone. So I think they embraced that and and, and really executed that well. Burks had a shot at that, that long pass in completion. Or, or I guess I should say, did you think that he might have been able to pull that in? I never – I mean, I, every time I think the attitude is every time that the ball's in the air, we got to expect that it's ours. So whether it's that one or another play to DeAndre or another pass, like, you know, that's the mentality that we have to take is that, you know, we we have to go make a play on, on the football uh, and, until we don't. So, you know, we'll, we'll keep, you know, working those and, and trying to hit them and, and help us you know, gain momentum and, and critical field position, um, you know, down the field. Why is it so hard to get him going? Um, you know, there's a lot of factors. I think just where the football goes and, you know, we tried to throw him the screen out there early in the game and, you know, they defended it. We didn't block it particularly well and uh, threw a shot to him, you know, so he's running hard and working and, you know, the ball went somewhere else. With the Hopkins, what, in your opinion, what about his skill set makes him so unique and effective? Uh, I mean, I think he's got great body control. I think he's got, um, you know, Hop's got a good understanding of the game and, and just, you know, a feel for setting things up and, and attacking leverage and being patient when he needs to be patient, you know, coming out of breaks when he, when he needs to come out with a certain pace and, um, you know, he's seen all different coverages. He's seen seen everything, and you know whether that's the ability to to come back on the back shoulder or you know find holes or seams in in the defense. What's maybe your challenge to players? I guess Mike coming off an emotional win on a short week to kind of forget about it and now focus on Houston. Yeah, focus on winning at home in the division, and you know every week is a new challenge. And you know they went on the road and. Didn't have their best performance. I'm sure they'll be ready for us like they always are. And, you know, we're going to have to, uh, you know, get healthy. We'll have to get prepared and, you know, build build towards Sunday. Last one. With the time that things pretty buttoned up on special teams for you, I, I don't think you gave up much at all in, in the return game. Um, yeah, I think we can always cover kickoffs better. I thought we punted well. I thought Colton Dow continues to, to really uh, factor on the punt game, beat, beat – uh, that double vice a few times and we're able to cause some fair catches and, you know, Rod, you know, a guy like Roger McCrary that's chasing receivers around and goes out there and plays on a, you know, punt return. You know, those are guys that, uh, you know, you need, need, need more guys like that. Thanks guys. That's Titans head coach, Mike Vrabel at the podium. 615-737-1045 is the number. A bunch of stuff in there about how the offensive line situation played itself out. Sounds like Daniel Brunskill um, is still in the rotation at right guard. That's an interesting way to approach it. But Calvin Throckmorton, they said they wanted a bigger body in there. Uh, Calvin Throckmorton had one of the four false starts that the Titans offensive line struggled with. That's something also Mike Vrabel addressed um, two on Dylan Radens, one on Throckmorton, who, again, is a real player, and Jalen Duncan, and a hold on Radens as well. So offensive line not setting themselves up for success early, but did, I think, acquit themselves pretty well uh, down the stretch when they needed those two touchdown drives. Let's go to AG in Nashville, who's trying us back. Oh, yeah, I want to say that uh, everybody been talking about very with this, very with it, but... Uh... The Dolphins coach, he's supposed to be some type of offensive genius. So, Rick Hill went down and a couple of more players. And look look how everything shifted for him. Mike Ray has been battling through injuries and all type of stuff for so long. 
and I just want to give him a shout out. I want to give Sam Murphy Bunton a shout out for uh, neutralizing one of their main weapons. And I want to say this is like the top 10 Titans performances I done seen, man. I'm talking about, I'm so optimistic about moving forward with the Titans. Man, forget a drop pick. Let's get this money. <laughs> Thanks for the call, AJ. It's a good it's a good way to end it. Are we banning people from the chat if they use the word draft? Because I've seen it. I've seen it. That's too much work. Okay. We'll stick to the phone lines. I'm Buck Rising. It's 1045 The Zone.
Well, I think the energy and fire, you know, is critical throughout, you know, the roster and uh, the staff and the organization and just being able to, you know, to do that. I think that, you know, leadership from the quarterback position is always going to be, you know, important. It's always going to be critical, you know, rally and inspire a, a football team. Obviously, it's a critical position. So, you know, I think you know, he'll continue to do that in, in his own particular way. Levis gets him on the ball. First and goal at the two. Levis looks, 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 pumps, steps up, looks, throws, caught, touchdown, Titans, DeAndre Hopkins, go. What happened? Amazing production. What are you talking about? (laughs) You know what? I'm done trying. I know. I'm not trying anymore. This is why I don't want to, I don't want to discourage you because I love that you're trying. I just, just, we're at the point in our relationship where, you know, borderline Joseph needs to come in here every day for marriage counseling and stuff like that. So the fact that you're trying new things in the bedroom is exciting. It's exciting. I don't want to discourage you. But I'm, the I'm, fact that we can't get it no, done. No, no, it's fine. Throwing these handcuffs in the trash. We're not, <laughs> we're not, we're not, we're not trying things anymore. Uh. <laughs> All right, so, so you did keep the fuzzy handcuffs from your Chris, from your <laughs> dirty Santa party. I did not win those. I did not win those. <laughs> D. Cashville says, "Pause, pause for what? What do you mean? What happened?" But anyway. Uh, so yes, that's Mike Frable talking about his quarterback, Will Levis. That's Will Levis throwing a late touchdown pass to DeAndre Hopkins. Uh, Levis, twenty-three of thirty-eight on the evening. Uh, 327 yards. He is the first rookie, according to Deron Davenport of ESPN, to throw for 300 plus yards on Monday Night Football, which to me is kind of a crazy number or kind of a crazy. I don't know. It's just the whole thing was crazy last night. The idea that they are that they are the only team out of it's 767 different results trailing by 14 with three minutes to go that came back and won a football game. Uh, He had the long completion of Hopkins, 45 yards. The touchdown to Hopkins, he did throw a pick six, thick six to a defensive tackle for Miami early in the game. Um, But I think that what anytime we talk about Will Levis, right, it's always about, all right, is he making progress? Can he be the future? Do we know this yet? Is he making progress, Lucas? Let's go down the checklist. Yes. Is he the future of the franchise through seven starts, Lucas? Uh, yes, which is why they drafted him, which is something that you hilariously refuted earlier this year. Oh, would you like to hilariously bring back uh, opinions uh, of a particular nature about the quarterback? Is that is is that an exercise on the heels of your exceptional production work that you would like to that you would like to do? Yeah, but I know I'm an idiot, so that <laughs> that doesn't bother me. Like, yeah, I was an idiot. Big shock. I thought Levis was a bad pick. I'm also an idiot. <laughs> it's just, it just, I don't know why it is. And maybe it's because you've watched too much Always Sunny in your life. I just, your mannerisms are so Charlie-esque at a certain point. I just picture you ramming your, your, <laughs> the, the heel of your hand into your forehead. Stupid, stupid, stupid. <laughs> um, But here's the thing. He's proving it every week. He's getting better every week. DeAndre Hopkins is helping him get better every week, and they're playing better around him. He's elevating his teammates. There's four games left. Three of them are divisional games, which is how the NFL exactly wants this situation to shake out. One of them is Seattle at home on Christmas Eve. I don't know that there's anything that's going to outright derail my opinion of what Will Levis is and can be for the future of the Tennessee Titans, but I think I'm comfortable at this point saying we are seeing that kind of growth. I would like him to, you know, rein in the just bleep it, (laughs) the level of not give a bleep (laughs) out there because at some point he's going to get hurt. He's big. He's strong. At some point he's going to get hurt. But it's better than the alternative, right? Oh, that they have no pulse whatsoever? He gives them life. It's the cliche you'd rather say, whoa, than go. Sure. And, and that's, you know, that's a conversation with some of the best quarterbacks in, in the sport. Patrick Mahomes is somebody who, until basically last year, was still kind of playing the quarterback position more frenetically than he was from a disciplined execution, timing, and rhythm standpoint. And we saw the best version of Patrick Mahomes en route to winning another Super Bowl last year. This year he's being let down by the receivers around him and things of that nature, but, like, 
as Levis cleans up some of this stuff, as he sees more defenses, as he gets in more opportunities to have comeback wins or to, you know, to, to lead from the front. How, however, these next four weeks play out, I'm comfortable enough with the money that they have around him and the investment that they've made in him that they can build around this quarterback for the future. This team is playing for this quarterback. This team is playing for this quarterback. The rookie class is playing for themselves, not for, for themselves, other. for each other. And they're play like, again, there are some some obvious downsides to playing a bunch of inexperienced rookies, okay? There is also an element of the college mentality that they are carrying over here that flatly just doesn't exist very much in the NFL, that you're playing for the playing for the pe- not that it doesn't exist that you're playing for the people alongside you, but that you're playing for something bigger than the check. And that I think is is being, you know, kind of brought to the forefront by how many young players who have just entered the league and are trying desperately to keep themselves from spiraling and keep the... I mean, Levis talked about this after the Carolina win. We got to get a win to get these guys' confidence up. Talking about, like, Derrick Henry and Jeff Simmons. What do you call them? Dogs. That you see them just kind of hanging their head in the locker room afterwards because they they don't know what to do with the amount of beatings that they've taken. Levis has done that, to his credit. This is Will Levis. I asked him... I, First question uh, I asked him, or that anybody asked him, when he lo- walked in the uh, walked in the post game press conference last night after sitting down with Scott Van Pelt was, "Hey, bud, how's your blood pressure?" That was that was awesome. Um, you know, I had to keep my composure there a little bit, make sure we finished the job. But I trust in our defense that they're going to get the job done just like they did all night. I mean, they they won us that game tonight, and they shut down a really potent offense. And if it wasn't for those couple turnovers there in the red zone, um, you know, it would have been even more impressive. So. Props to them, uh, and then obviously we, we were able to get the job done with uh, our operational efficiency on those two two-minute drives. So I'm just pumped all around. What was your first 300-yard pass in the game, and also the first come-from-behind game-winning drive? As you go through that, like, what were some of the thoughts you know on the last drive? Just trusting what I'm seeing, um, trusting our guys being in the right spots, and just you know throwing it to the open guy. And it's sometimes it's as simple as that. And our guys held up up front. Felt, didn't feel any pressure for the most part. And um, when that happens and we have time and, 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 and dudes are in the right spots, uh, it's a beautiful thing. And that's what happened on those two drives. Indeed they did. They got down the field real quick. I mean, they, you, you mentioned like kind of different versions of the Titans that you saw play out in one game. It It doesn't get much different than the way that they went about scoring touchdowns in last night's game than – a 14 play 73 yard drive uh that took 713 off the clock a 12 play drive that went 70 yards had three first downs went for a field goal and took 544 off the clock the type of series that they wanted going in right that's how they wanted to win this game titans football and then turning around in the final well not the final two possessions but two of the final three possessions because the final possession was a kneel down. They went nine plays, 80 yards, touchdown. Four plays, 61 yards, touchdown. Two Americas, two versions of Titans football. Last call for phone calls, update the polls. That's next.
Herring, man is wide open. Two for Tennessee, Nick Westbrook Akine, and the Titans are within six with 2.40 to play. Here we go. That was a two-point conversion down eight. Titans opted to go for it. Play in the math. How about that? Next-gen Titans, next-gen stats, analytics. Oh, my God. Math. Math and football. Nerds rejoice. It's a good play, though. One-point win for the Titans in Miami. Upset of the season in the NFL thus far. I don't know that we'll see a bigger upset this year. I don't. Th- I haven't looked at the remaining schedule and games and things like that. I can't imagine there'd be a bigger point spread this year than 13 and a half points between two teams. What was the biggest upset prior? On the know, season? Yeah, I don't know what the Lions spread was against the Bears. It's a good question. Um, it was I, in Chicago. I, I, I went through uh, a bunch of... Uh, I went through a bunch of like results because I saw that stat floating around on the internet and a couple of people I, th- I think had misconstrued it because it was being presented as the biggest upset in a century of football, which means in the last 100, 100 years of football, that last night with the Titans at 5-8 and eight, did to the Dolphins at 9-4 and four was the upset of the century, of which, Lucas, I said into the microphone or into the phone on my Uber back from the airport this morning and you scoffed at me. No, upset of the century is... Giants beating the 17 and 0 New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. That's the upset. Don't tell Will Levis that. <laughs> Don't tell him. I mean, last night was awesome, but <laughs> come on. Uh, last call for phone calls. Muhammad is next. Uh, yes. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, how's everybody doing? Besides last night, uh, this game was awesome. Um, uh, you know, every game's got its twos and cues, and I just want to give a Brief shout out to Levis. You know, he was composed. He, you know, kept his head up in the game, even regardless of all the turnovers that unfortunately happened. I mean, he's a rookie. Rookie mistakes always happen. And I also wanted to give a shout out to the coach, Mike Rabel. I know a lot of people on social media are calling for Mike Rabel to be fired and whatnot. And I just want to say, Mike Rabel is definitely. Not going anywhere. I mean, he's playing with the with the with with the tools that he's got, and you know, as and the coaching aspect, it might be harder for him because you don't have all the talent that you need, especially like with the offensive line. A couple weeks ago, you guys missed a call on me because I, I ended up getting disconnected because of uh be, me being frustrated over the game. Uh, things are starting to change, and I'm seeing it. I know we're trying to. Uh, develop into a uh, pass-first offense, you know, go away with Derrick Henry. And I feel like, you know, we got, we still got to bring that tempo on the offense. Keep, team, keep, keep the team guessing. I mean, Thank you for the call, Muhammad. That music in the background. What the hell? Yeah, a quick hook. My <laughs> fault. Jackson, Jackson's been doing that on purpose. Whenever I'm in there, does he do that to you? No. Where he plays the Oscars music and then he just <laughs> just pulls it out? No. It's always jarring. What I meant to say, Muhammad, is that we have the 60-second timer with the Oscars music uh, just to keep the calls moving, but we appreciate your point. Um, shout out. Does he, he, say, he said Will Levis? Yes, he did mispronounce the name. Will Levis is the starting quarterback for the Tennessee Titans. It's, it's okay if you don't know it now, but a lot more people know it after last night. Polls, please. I don't know who you are, but I know what it's time for. A poll update on the Buck Rising Show. Here's a young man with a very particular set of skills. With the final numbers, here's Buck Rising Show correspondent and producer, Lucas Panzica. Presented by Two Rivers Ford, who sells below MSRP on any non-specialty new Ford. What was the craziest part of the Titans win over the Dolphins. Goody says the Titans just love playing drunk football. Brian says, I don't know, because I didn't watch it. I missed the Music City miracle after I stopped watching because I was upset and did the same thing last night. Why can I not watch when good things happen? Let Will Cook on Twitter says the fact that Harold Landry had three sacks and basically gets zero recognition. He's come a long way Since that week one performance, Karen says the most surprising thing was that they won. Mahogany says that they went 0 for 3 on the keys to winning and still won. Yeah, I mean, the the most improbable or the most ridiculous or the best part of it was the entire game. The fact that the game was entertaining and the Titans, you know, instead of 
playing a dramatic, what could have been a back-to-back soul-crushing losses, came out on the right side of this one uh, when there were a million and one reasons why they should absolutely not have. What did you learn about Will Levis last night? Puka says that he's tough physically and mentally, but he's going to hurt his shoulder if he's not careful. Karen says resiliency. Ken says he learned he is the franchise quarterback. Anthony echoed that. Chris says he learned that he's a gamer. Rookie quarterbacks are going to have highs and lows. The pick six, the bad pitch were ugly, but he stayed grounded and led the way on two huge drives. Think we found our guy, he says. I don't know that I'd, I would describe him as grounded right now. I would describe him as red-faced and screaming. <laughs> I think Hopkins is the grounded one, and that is there to ground the young rookie quarterback as he loses yep. his mind down in and down out uh, but compo- which by the way i love it's sure. delightful i'm sure you know at some point you want to rail, rail it in a little bit but <laughs> uh it, it would be a big problem if you know it, it was like joe milton balls right and and these balls are just firing into the stands it's like buddy calm down but who's composed enough to win the game what more do you need do you care about the titans draft position today 76 percent say no And if you do, bleep yourself. I'm not talking to you about drafts. Get out of here. What in sports made you say, oh, no, this weekend? Puka says it was Mahomes yelling uh, toward, not at Josh Allen. He wasn't yelling at Allen, but was was speaking at Allen about that officiating decision. The worst bleeping call I've ever seen while he's hugging Josh Allen postgame. Did you see this? He came out and apologized afterwards. Oh, no, for sure. And Josh Allen is thinking, buddy, uh, they changed the overtime rules for you. Okay, relax for a minute. Uh, you've won two Super Bowls. Please calm down. Those are the polls. Excellent. That was a fun show. The rare the rare road victory Monday. Congratulations Tuesday. to you. Whatever it is. Congratulations to your football team. Uh, the fact that we got through that with almost no slip-ups is a credit to us because I uh, feel like I'm going to collapse. So I'm going to go home and do that <laughs> because I'm very tired. Your football team kept me up all last night, but it was worth it because it was fun. Have a great rest of your afternoon. I know you're going to have more fun coming up next. Why wouldn't you? It's Blaine and Mickey.